The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. Hi, this is Mia Mohsen Zia, also known as Mia No Time for Love. Check out my latest book, Missing, available in print and e-book formats on Amazon. It's now time for the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and sponsored by international award-winning author Mia Mohsen Zia of Missing. The Mike Wagner Show can be heard on over 40 podcast platforms, as well as HamiltonRadio.net, Diamonds FM, and the TheMikeWagnerShow.com. We can be heard in over 100 countries, featuring over 1,000 well-known and amazing guests throughout the globe, and named one of the top 100 global podcasts in the New York Weekly Times, Hollywood Entertainment News, Los Angeles Weekly Times, Apple, and Chartable. So sit back and relax and enjoy another great episode of the award-winning Mike Wagner Show. Hey everybody, it's Mike from the Mike Wagner Show, powered by Sonic Web Studios and brought to you by official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, international warring author, Mia Molson's The Missing, available on Amazon and Paperback and Ebook. We're here with a terrific gentleman who's a board-certified uh, plastic reconstructive um, surgeon uh, pra- uh, and practicing in Los Angeles. He's nominated for Rhodes Scholarship and also selected as a university medal finalist at UC Berkeley and a graduate from Yale University School of Medicine. And, and he believes strongly in the importance of performance awake surgery without uh, changing patients uh, physiology to provide safest surgery possible. We'll talk about that. He's also a pioneer and leading expert in the awake plastic surgery and, and focus on eyes, lid, facelift, rhinoplasty, breast, breast surgeries, and more as well. Live, ladies and gentlemen, the Plus Studio is in beautiful downtown Los Angeles, the amazing board certified uh, plastic reconstructive surgeon from Los Angeles. And he, and, and he does a thing where he investigates the strategies to mitigate the anesthesia related memory loss. And what's so amazing about it? We'll find out with the amazing multi talented Dr. Kenneth Kim. Dr. Kim, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, hi. Nice to uh, nice to see you, Mike. Well, it's great to have you on board as well, too. As you're a board certified plastic reconstructive surgeon practicing in Los Angeles, you, you're nominated for Rhodes Scholarship, selected um, at the University of Men- Men- Medal finalist at UC Berkeley, and you graduate from Yale University School of Medicine, and you also believe in the importance of uh, performance awake uh, surgery without changing the uh, patient's physiology to provide the safest surgery possible, and you're a pioneer and lean expert in awake plastic surgery and focus on eyes, lid, eyelids, facelift, rhinoplasty, and also breast surgery as well, too, and you're always investigating the new strategies to mitigate anesthesia-related memory loss. And before getting all that, uh, Dr. Kim, tell us how you first got started. Yes. So, you know, I've been a plastic surgeon for now uh, 17 years, board-certified plastic surgeon. Wow. And, um, you know, if you think about the way surgery is done, you know, surgery hasn't progressed in the past roughly 100 years. What I mean by that is that, you know, a patient is put to sleep, and then, you know, and then the patient wakes up and that's, people just think that that's just the way it is. But, you know, if that really is the case where you actually just go to sleep and you wake up and nothing's, you know, nothing goes wrong, then, then there's no reason to change. But the fact is, is that general anesthesia has its own inherent risk. So what are they? So, you know, these are blood clots. So people's blood can clot and that can cause um, pulmonary embolism, which means you're having difficulty breathing. That can be life-threatening. People can have a heart attack. Um, I mean, there are, people can have a stroke. And another thing that people may not be aware of is memory loss. So people think that, oh, well, you know, me going to sleep and waking up is no big deal. But, you know, if the risk that I just mentioned about blood clots causing, you know, issues with your body and heart, those are significant and you will notice it right away. But memory loss is one of those things where you notice it, people near you wonder, oh, you know what, your ability to recall information or your ability to process information is not as great. And, uh, and these people, they don't understand why this is happening. And I think that, um, you know, throughout my practice, I've noticed that the people who undergo general anesthesia, so the research has shown that 
any general anesthesia going over two hours will cause um, neurons, which are which are cells in your brain, specifically at the hippocampus, which is an area that deals with memory forming part of the brain, it kills neurons at the hippocampus. And so um, I just think that with, you know, with advancements, you know, with modern civilization and with, you know, things are changing in terms of now we have electric cars, now we have cell phones, yet computers, yet you know, surgery really hasn't changed. And we're still putting our patients subject, we're subjecting them to all these risks. And, um, you know, if you look at, like, let's say, sci-fi movies, or in the future, you know, where people are operating in space, patients, people are awake when you're doing surgery, because they realize, right. like, you really shouldn't be asleep. I mean, can you do that? Because, and why is it that in the future, people always envision that you could do surgery awake? Because if you think about it, everything should be made more simply and more without any, um, any extra things that you don't need. For instance, like cell phones, nowadays, you know, we could just, our cell phone is just as powerful as computers, you know, 20 years ago, right? Mm -hmm. Or even 10 years ago now. And, uh, and same with, you know, surgery is that we don't have to put people under to do the surgery. Then, then the question is, is, you know, what is happening during general anesthesia? Because patients will think, oh, I'm just going to sleep. But what is happening is that you're put in a very deep sedative state. What that means is that your body is immobile. And your brain is put in a, almost in a comatose state. So if you think about when we go to sleep, what happens when we go to sleep? You twist and you, you toss and turn, right? You move around a little bit. And then your brain is not put into this deep state of sleep. So what I mean is that if you're sleeping and you hear a noise, loud noise, or somebody shakes you, you wake up. That's how people wake up with alarm clock. However, when you're put to sleep, the, the, you're in such a deep state of uh, sleep that a person can be cut open and you don't wake up. That is an incredibly deep state of sleep if you really think about that, right? So we're not sleeping, we are put in a comatose state. Mm. And when a brain is shut off like that, the data is showing that our brain just doesn't like that. And what happens is that during that process, our cells are actually dying. And so, you know, so especially these are especially important for people over 60. So the data are showing that people over 60 is, is pretty significant and also developing brains. So if you talk to pediatric neurosurgeons, which are, you know, brain surgeons who operate on kids, they know that general anesthesia is really bad for their brain. Because you, as you follow them, you realize that their brain development is delayed. And, uh, you know, so if it's bad for developing brain, it's bad for uh, older brain, people who are older in their 60s or 65 and above. It's also not good for young, young people, young person's brain. And then let's say you have a young, very healthy person and they say, you know what? I had general anesthesia and I'm fine. But the question you have to ask is one is um, how long was your surgery? And off, you know, if it's short, okay, that's great. But any surgery that goes over two hours, the data is showing that it's killing uh, brain cells. But then why is it that young people can recover and or they don't notice it as much? because young people have tremendous amount of physiologic reserve. What that means is that the brain cells, they have, they have the most amount of brain cells at that time because they have grown, right? And so if they lose a little bit of brain cells, they could still process, they could still function very well with that. Hmm. However, as we get older, brain is an organ, just like any organ in our body, it weakens over time. So, what happens is that if you have decreased neurons or decreased brain cells or decreased effect connectivity, and then now you take away a good chunk of it because of general anesthesia, 
then these older people really take a hit and they really notice it. And the way I look at it is that there are two types of surgery. One is a um, elective surgery and other is mandatory surgery for, you know, for things that you really need, right? Or, non elective or, or like, you know, emergency, something happening, emergency, like a heart exactly. attack, or it's like, like, like say you, um, you, you're walking, you fall over, you, uh, you, you break your knee and stuff like that. You have to go in for knee surgery, that type. Right. So you have exactly so you have elective and non-elective. So if it's non-elective, by all means, get, you know, get the job done. But if you're doing an elective surgery, elective means you're doing something because you want to do it. Um, for instance, if you're doing cosmetic surgery, just because you want to look younger or what have you, then I just think that it is very important for people to have surgery uh, without having these devastating negative effect. Because once you lose brain cells at the hippocampus, there are two areas where the brain cells don't regenerate. And that is the memory forming part of the brain, which is the hippocampus. And the other is olfactory, which is the smell. Mm. So these two areas, they just don't regenerate. So you don't want to lose them. And, um, and that's why COVID, when people lost smell, it was pretty devastating for them. And uh, so, you know, I just think that patients should be aware of them. And you're mentioning about like, even like breaking, like, you know, orthopedic issues or even somebody falls. Nowadays, more and more um, surgeons are trying to, even for these surgeries, um, they're trying to do it awake because they understand that putting somebody to sleep has all these negative effects. Mm -hmm. and, and and what about oral surgery? Like say you have to get your wisdom tooth pulled. It's like, you know, you're under anesthesia. Is that going to be uh, effective as well with the awake surgery? Like say you have your uh, wisdom tooth pulled or like an emergency, um, like say you got your teeth broke, you know, hockey puck got thrown at you or something. Right. I mean, with anything, if you really think about it, um, you could do surgery any way possible. Um, so initially the his, you know, historically the general anesthesia came first, right? And then the general anesthesia was used to put animals to sleep and we're using those, um, the gases, right? And, uh, so, and then we have now local anesthesia. So I'm at, what I'm advocating is used local anesthesia rather than general anesthesia. So let's say, um, you know, we all know that when we go to the dentist, we just a lot, often we use just, we get numbing shot and then we get the procedure done. Um, but for the rest of the body, you could still do that. And so if you're doing like a facelift, you're doing eyelid surgery, rhinoplasty, breast augmentation, there's no reason to be under and subject yourself to that, to the, the effect of memory loss. Again, mm -hmm. I'm talking about like heart attacks and blood clots. Those are not as common. So, you know, I think that's okay. And, and what I mean, okay, is that, you know, the, the, the chances of those are not as great, but memory loss, it hits everybody mm -hmm. because there's, there's no, it, there's, that's something that you can't avoid. Mm -hmm. And you, you, surgery is going over two hours. Yes. Mm -hmm. now, now you talk about the blood clots as well too, you know, affecting surgeries and everything like that with anesthesia and everything. Does it affect all blood types like O positive, O negative, A positive, A negative, B positive, B negative? Does it type all of them or is it just certain ones? Yeah. So blood clot is the reason why the blood clot happens. The answer is it happens for everybody. It does. And the reason why blood clot happens is because you're immobile. So if you're riding in an airplane, I don't know if you remember Dan Quayle. He was a vice president under George Bush Sr. I remember, So Dan yes. Quayle had a blood clot traveling from uh, flying trans-America, trans-Atlantic, okay? I mean, trans-America. So he was going from one coast to another, and he developed a blood clot from sitting in an airplane for six hours. Oh, my so goodness. Doing, wow. Yeah. So, so the way our body is, is that... Our body was designed to be active. We weren't meant to be bedridden and lying down. Mm -hmm. Because what happens is that if you draw blood to get blood drawn, and if you just leave it there, the blood will just clot. 
And it's, it's the mechanism, so blood, our blood is designed to move and circulate. It's supposed to go to the heart, the heart pumps and it moves around. But what happens is that as it moves, it needs the muscles of the legs to help pump and move. That's why if you're taking a long international flight, you should be walking around, going to the bathroom. You shouldn't just be sitting in one area for a mm -hmm. long time. It, right? it, it, would, it would get tiring, I agree. Even it's like, you know, you know, go up to a cabin, say hello to a captain and crew, or go to the bathroom, walk up, ask the stewardess for a drink, and maybe, you know, get a newspaper or whatever, or maybe just have a new thing where it's like you go from a uh, coach to first class, you know, walk around and um, or go in a lounge, you know, or do something like that. And of course, you know, talk about blood clots and everything. And of course, you know, if you have a wake surgery, or what if you're having like heart surgery? Are you allowed to, um, you know, watch your own surgery? Because some of the questions I kind of have, it's like, you know, are you allowed to watch yourself, you know, what's happening down here? Or you look at the screen and everything like that? Yeah. Well, something like heart surgery, that depends on the heart surgeon. I mean, I'm not a heart surgeon. I'm a plastic surgeon. So I do all my plastic surgery uh, awake. Um, but, you know, but you know, I'm not a heart surgeon, so I can't make a comment for that. But again, heart surgery is more of a life-threatening issue. So that is non-elective. So I'd rather have the patient, have the surgeon, the heart surgeon, be comfortable with what he or she is comfortable with and get the job done. So I'm okay. not talking about these type of life-threatening surgeries. You know, uh, What I'm talking about is an elective surgery where a lot of surgery is elective. And another thing that is should be very startling for the listeners is that dementia is expected to triple uh, in year within the year twenty well year twenty fifty, which is twenty seven years, essentially twenty five years later, twenty seven years later. Oh my goodness! It is wow. expected to triple, so it's not going to double; it's going to triple. That is insane. That is a that is a horrendous figure right there. Mm. And so, what is going on? And I'm not saying that this is all due to surgery and this is all due to anesthesia. Obviously, there are other factors involved. So, what is going on in our modern society? Well, one of them is that a lot of people are also taking uh, anti-anxiety medications, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are also taking sleep uh, sleeping medications. Mm -hmm. So research has also shown that sleeping medication and anti-anxiety medication is also bad for the brain. And that also is linked to dementia as well. Wow. Then the question again is why? Because, you know, so many Americans, you know, more than 10% of Americans up to 20% uh, percent of Americans are taking either anti-anxiety medication or sleeping medications. And the data is showing that a lot of data, some other data is showing it's even higher. So why are so many people so with all those with and, and then, then you have to think what is the problem here what's wrong with that what's wrong with taking sleeping medication because as i said our brain was not meant to be forcefully meant to go to sleep mm -hmm. and and even anti-anxiety medication it's like you're forcing your brain to calm it down and so what i'm trying to let people know is that optimally you should live the way nature or the way our body was designed mm -hmm. and our body was designed to not, not be messed around with right and um you know again not so then there, there's a medical term called physiology right mm -hmm. make keep them in a normal physiology which means physiology means body function so if you could do surgery under normal condition, then there is no risk of that. We could just do what we need to do. Let's say you have a little tumor and you just need to get it, get rid of it. It's not a life-threatening tumor. Right. It, it's, it's, it's like, say, a bulge on your head or a bulge on your yeah, shoulder. Exactly. Arm, exactly. Chest, wherever. Yes. Exactly. Or, you know, as I mentioned, as a plastic surgeon, we take a lot of these tumors out, but we also do cosmetic surgery. You just want to have a more lifted face or eyelid surgery of skin hooding, things like that. Mm -hmm. Just do it under local anesthesia. Mm -hmm. So the whole concept is, is how do you minimize collateral damage? And if you, if I tell you, Mike, 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to get in there, take out the tumor, or I'm going to get in there, remove the excess skin and the, and the, the sagging muscle, and I'm just going to lift it back up. You're going to be like, and, and I'm not going to damage the tissues around it. You'll be like, you say, that sounds great. But if I tell you, you know what, I'm going to paralyze you. I'm going to put you in a comatose state. And then I'm going to cause a lot of trauma around it. You'll be like, ooh, that doesn't sound good. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by trauma around it? So if you're under local anesthesia, then sur the surgeon has to be much more precise because they have to really, really stay within that area. So the surgery is much more precise. Mm. And also the pain is also significantly less. Mm. So what do I mean by that? So let's take an example. Let's say like you do a breast, like a woman does a breast augmentation. If a woman does a breast augmentation, she'll be in pain for about, about a, you know, at least a few days to a week. Some people even up to a month, they're in pain. Whereas if you're awake, then first of all, they're awake during the whole time. So there's no pain. They walk out right away compared to under general anesthesia. They have to be wheeled out on a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And then that night, the patient, she could just go, go out to dinner at a restaurant. Or if she wants to cook, she could make her own dinner. Nice. And she could move her arms right away. Mm. And so essentially, you know, she'll be basically taking maybe a Tylenol or two that night. And that's it. Compared to somebody under general anesthesia, taking opioid, which is a narcotic medication for, you know, many days to even weeks. And so, and the reason is, is that there are two reasons why being awake has so much advantage is that one is it forces the surgeon to be much more precise. So you're not hitting all these nerves, you're not hitting all these other tissue that's causing inflammation and that's traumatizing. But then the other is that these nerves are already, they're blocked before you cut them. So these, these peripheral, the sensory nerves that you're operating on, they're not stimulated. Compared to if you're under general anesthesia, what happens is that even though you're asleep, that nerve is fired up, that nerve is activated and that, that nerve is sending signals to your brain. And if you think that, mm, I don't think so, I'm just asleep and everything is fine, no. So what happens is that when you wake up, you wake up with pain. I don't know if you know that. So if you ever, anybody who has general anesthesia, they know if you go to a recovery room, it's called post-operative uh, recovery room, you hear a lot of agony. People are screaming, moaning. Why? Because they wake up and they have so much pain. And then the nurse and, or the anesthesiologist has to chase them with, give them pain medication. And then another thing is that there was a very famous study looking at infants who had open heart surgery. Ooh. These are infants. And they're wondering why certain infants survive and why certain infants don't survive when they undergo the same surgery. So looking at all the same parameters, they want to know what, what, is the, what are the important factors that determine whether one type of baby survive and others don't. And so during the surgery, they measured all the blood work, all the parameters. And then and what they found was that the babies who survived had less stress hormones that were released. And then the babies who did not survive had incredible amount of stress hormones that are released. So wow. these stress hormones, adrenaline and these cortisol, all these stress hormones, the problem with them is that it, it makes your, 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 you're put in the state of fight or flight and these babies are small and they can't handle all that stress. Mm -hmm. So then in the, the heart couldn't take it, the organ starts clamping down. And so what it's showing, what it showed is that even though the, we think that baby's asleep, the body feels the pain. Mm. That's why the stress hormone is going up. If, if you're asleep and your body doesn't feel the pain, then the stress hormone wouldn't go up, wouldn't, wouldn't jump up like that. Mm. that so the babies who survived, they had a much better stress 
body stress release uh, response. So if you look at, let's say, a fighter pilot versus, you know, a fighter pilot's ability to tolerate tremendous Gs and hard turns and doing a flip versus someone like me, I would just flip out. And I, would just <laughs> I, I, and I think then, many of us would who have never been in that situation before. You're right. <laughs> exactly. And then if you go to, a, you know, if you go to a, a you know, flight uh, you know, aviation school, there's a term for these pilots who are just natural. You know, they don't, they don't freak out. Their, their pulse rate stays the same. And they don't just jump up. Their blood pressure doesn't jump because their body just naturally handles stress much better. And they're actually called golden boys because they're, they're just kind of built that way. They don't tolerate stress that much. But the rest of the mortals like us, you know, we have tremendous amount. Of, we, we will get a lot of stress from that, right? Mm. So if you put an old, very, very, very old, frail person and you give them tremendous stress, that can kill that person. Just like an infant, infant is so fragile. When they re- when they have all that stress hormone that's being released, that was one of the huge contributing factor that determined it. So the point I'm telling you this story is that when you're asleep, your body feels it. And that's why uh, a person, a woman, let's say, undergo breast augmentation, she wakes up with that pain, the nerves are revved up, and that's why they're on these pain medications. And this is not only for breast augmentation, this is for all kinds of surgeries. And therefore, CDC, Center for Disease Control, they looked at patients who had surgery and their use of opioid, so narcotic medications long-term. And they found that uh, one out of four patients would take them for more than three months. Wow. That is an addiction right there. And we are wondering Boy, worse than Viking, and I'll tell you. Well, we are, we are right now wondering like there's a lot of talk about fentanyl overdose and this opioid, you know, pen, epidemic, this and that. And you know, people are saying this is an epidemic. But where when did this happen? And how does that happen? And you know, what happened was that the company pharmaceutical companies that were making these opioids. They were really pushing it during the uh, basically during the 1990s when they really started it late mm-hmm. 19, 1990s. I, that was when I was in that when I was in medical school and when I was an intern. We noticed it. It was just very aggressively they were pushing for it. Mm-hmm. So a lot of times these people who are addicted to opioids who are and people think oh these are drug addicts, but if you look at them, they're just normal per, normal people living in middle of America doing normal jobs, you would never expect them to be drug addicts. But they were introduced often from doctors because they had surgery or what what have you. And the reason why this happens is that a lot of these people have an addictive uh, person, addictive, the body is get addicted to these uh, medications more than some other people. So if you have that kind of uh, body physiology, then these people are very susceptible to addiction. And that's why that's another huge advantage of being awake and not being under, because then you won't even, you won't even get addicted to, you won't even get a, a, introduced to these opioids. Mm. That, and is, it, that is rather interesting. And we'll go more into that about um, with what you do with the um, eyelids, facelift, rhinoplasty, and uh, breast surgeries in your practice as well with um, Dr. Kenneth Kim. But first, listen to the Mike Widener Show at the themikewidenershow.com, powered by Sonic Web Studios. Visit online at sonicwebstudios.com for all you need. Look at a professional website without breaking your budget. Sonic Web Studios is the answer. Sonic Web Studios offers fast, affordable custom web designs that blow the competition away. Call today, 1-800-303-3960. It's 1-800-303-3960 or email to support at sonicwebstudios.com. Mention the Mike Whitener Show. Get 20% off your first project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Also, time to give official shout out to our official sponsor of the Mike Whitener Show, international warring author Mia molson If you love fast-paced mysteries, you'll love Missing by Mia molson available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. Missing is fast-paced and intriguing with an unforgettable twist. Takes place in four countries. Two strangers, one target. Where truth is illusion and those who love be the first go missing. It's available on Amazon and paperback and ebook. 
Missing by Mia Molson Zay has garnered great reviews. And Evil Eleven endorsed by Howard Celebrities, including Joanna Cassie, Forge Varley, and Miggles. So grab your copy today for Girls Missing by Mia Molson Zia, <coughs> available on Amazon. Also, check out the Mike Widener Show at the themikewidenershow.com or 40 podcast platforms. Heard in 100 countries, including Facebook, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Spotify, iHeartRadio, also Apple Music, Odyssey, iHeart, Google Play, iTunes, as well as um, Amazon, Audible, BitChute, Rumble. Follow us, subscribe on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, and more. Tickets with you on any mobile device. And for great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Widener Show podcast, T-shirts, pop sockets, throw pillows, tote bags, hoodies. Makes great gifts 24-7. Go to Amazon.com. Check out the Mike Widener Show podcast. And for more great gift ideas, go to Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia for great books like Missing, Once, and Wrinkles, plus T-shirts, pop sockets, hoodies, phone cases, and more. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. Check it out today. Amazon.com slash Mia Molson Zia. If you're looking for a gift for a loved one, and I'll support the Mike Widener Show on Anchor FM, PayPal, and themikewidenershow.com. We're here with the amazing board-certified uh, plastic reconstructed surgeon practicing in Los Angeles, Dr. Kenneth Kim here on the Mike Widener Show. And you've been doing this for quite some time, being a pioneer and leading expert in um, plastic surgery, being awake as well. You talked about um, the necessity of it. And um, how'd you first get into uh, plastic surgery and explain the route, um, how, you, how you got there in the first place? So um, when I was in medical school, um, I looked at certain surge. I uh, looked at various type of surgeries. I knew that I wanted to be a uh, surgeon because I was, you know, good with my hands. Mm -hmm. And um, one thing that really intrigued me was that certain patients did really well. I mean, and and certain patients didn't do well, and they're both doing the same type of surgery. And uh, and then one one thing I noticed that when I would rotate through one particular surgeon, there was a one particular surgeon at Yale, his patients always did really well, minimal discomfort. And, and I was like, what is it about this surgeon that he's doing that is so much better than other surgeons when other patients are in agony? And then, so I realized that surgical precision is very important. And, um, and then, so you know, I, as I said, when you, when you love surgery, then plastic surgery is kind of the ultimate surgery because you're doing, you're operating all over the body and, um, and it really requires a lot of, you know, hand-eye coordination and, and precision. And that's, and then with that precision in mind, um, I want to really develop this field of, of how can we actually do surgery without putting people to sleep. Mm -hmm. And again, how do we do an optimal surgery? And an optimal surgery is where a patient can recover like what I just said, you know, you are doing a major surgery and that, and then they just walk out. All these uh, TVs or movies where you see patients going to, you know, having surgery and they're being wheeled out and they're groggy, this and that, that is not what pe what patient what people should accept um that should be in the past again mm -hmm. or if it's an or if it's a uh, non-elective surgery then okay that's fine but if it's an elective surgery where a surgeon can plan how we're going to do it then you shouldn't accept that uh, i'll give you an example you know it's, it's like if you're trying to let's say uh, you're trying to rescue a hostage then the most optimal thing is to send like a Navy special forces. And then the special forces will go in there and rescue the uh, hostage and then come out, right? Mm -hmm. However, if we go and we just bombard and bomb the whole you know, city, then there's gonna be a lot of collateral damage and nobody wants that. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and of course, and just, raising raising more stress trying to rescue that hostage. You know, it's like you walk in, just grab and take out, but then you come in and like, you know, you know, blow up uh, 10 billings just to get that hostage. It causes more stress than that um that hostage itself. It's like, what if that rock, you know, falls on its head and, and dead? You know what I'm saying? Right. And then also the, the collateral damage that it's doing, right? So if the so if I'm if I'm doing the surgery and then let's say I injure the nerve. I injure other surrounding vital structures, then your body is paying the price, right? And so I wanted to develop a, create a surgery, develop a surgery where we could do the least amount of trauma to the body. 
So doing a surgery in an ultra precision manner. So again, if the surgery is done that precisely, then the patient will notice the difference. Mm -hmm. And um, and so one other thing it also is not hitting blood vessels. Oh, because yeah. That, I think that's a big issue that's been going on with most people hitting a blood vessel and then you know, that put a lot of trauma as well, too. So, I mean, you, you were hitting some really good points in there, Dr. Kim. Right. Because Very if you think points. about Right. Because if you think about it, patients just assume that if you have surgery, then you're going to be black and blue. Like if you do a rhinoplasty, they think they're going to be black and blue. If they do a facelift, they're going to have, you know, bruising everywhere and their face is going to be puffed up, uh, things in that nature. But if the surgery is done in an ultra preci precise manner where the blood vessels are not cut, then the recovery is so fast. You have basically literally no bruising or minimal bruising. It's hardly noticeable. And then what is also important about that is that, you know, people think that, oh, well, I have bruising, I'm swollen, I have longer downtime, but, you know, so what? Mm -hmm. Well, what people don't understand is that, remember, the key point, again, is that we should not change your physiology, which means your body function. If you hit blood vessels, that means that blood vessel's job is to take red blood cells and take them to where it needs to go. But if that road is blocked, then the nutrients can't get there. It's like if you have a city and you're bombing all the roads around it, then you know the cars and the trucks can't get, get there to deliver food, um, gasoline, energy, whatever people need to live no, their normal life. Now, if it's a city and you're bombing a bunch of roads, okay, fine. You could always remake the you, you could always remake the roads. Okay. It's a nuisance, but you could always remake it. Mm -hmm. However, blood vessels, if you cut them, now you cut them. And so now you have less. So now these cells can't get to where it needs to go. And um, so then the cells are not getting the optimal nutrients, the oxygen and the nutrients, right? And how do cells die? Cells die. How do people die if you don't get oxygen and nutrients? So the cells are the same thing. You need oxygen and nutrients. Another important thing about not causing uh, bleeding is that blood belongs in a blood vessel. But once you cut the blood vessel and then the blood is staining everything is in the surrounding tissue, then that increases uh, infection. So you hear mm. about post-operative infection, you hear about, oh, this person had an infection, this and that. And you have to ask yourself, why did that person have an infection? And you know, people just assume like, well, I guess you just have an infection. Well, one of the big factor of infection is bleeding because bacteria live off of blood. So mm -hmm. in a laboratory, if you want to grow bacteria, you give them serum. And what is serum? Serum is blood. Okay. And so if you, it's part of a blood. So if you want to grow bacteria, then you get, you bleed and you let that blood just stay there. And then it's feeding the bacteria. So if you want to, if you want to grow terrorist, you feed the terrorist, you give them all the stuff that they need, then the terrorist will just grow and grow and grow. But the best way to get rid of a terrorist is you starve them to death, right? Mm -hmm. So they can't, next meal, they have, they have no meals next meal. So they can't even think about terrorism because they have to survive. Right. And if you don't, and if they can't get any meals, then they will eventually starve to death. Mm -hmm. And bacteria, our body has bacteria everywhere. And so... You know, so when you are operating and then you are bleeding, then you increase your chance of uh, of bleed of uh, infection. Mm -hmm. Also, makes me think of the uh, the tools as well too. Sometimes the tools are clean, sometimes they're not. They're not proper as well too. And um, you know, what about laser surgery? Would that contribute to as well, or would that be like an improvement in your case? Do you recommend laser surgery in these uh, situations, like awake surgery, to prevent all the problems? Yeah, so um, the thing about the tools is that at this point, you know, the tools being contaminated is so, so, so rare. 
because you have to go through a sterilization process. And, and so that sterilization process doesn't get broken because it's, it's heated up in such an intense heat. So um, if you're operating you know, in a modern society, I don't think that is a major issue. Okay. Um, and, and, and if that was the case, then let's say you're doing, um, uh, going back to breast augmentation, you do one breast augmentation and you do another breast, you do two breasts. And uh, for women who are listening or husbands with or wives or guys with girlfriends who have breast augmentation, they realize that one side of the breast can become hard and the other side is soft. So that is called capsular contracture. And what capsular contracture is scar tissue formation. And that's making the breast hard. And capsular contractor happens because of bacteria overgrowth. It causes inflammation. And then your body has to fight with the bacteria and it causes all this scar tissue. Then the question is, is why is it that it only happens on one breast? And if it happens to one breast, and then, or if it happens to both breasts, one breast is much more severe and the other is very minimal or only one breast. So if you're... Uh, thought, which is contamination because of improper sterilization, then both breasts should have an infection, but it's not. And, and the reason why that happens is because of bleeding, because they have asymmetric bleeding. One side just bled more than the other. Mm. Then you could say, why don't you control the bleeding? Why can't you just stop the bleeding be, you know, during surgery? Does surgeon want bleeding to be all over the place? No surgeons want bleeding to be around. But the problem is, is that when you're under general anesthesia, naturally your blood pressure drops. So anybody who undergoes general anesthesia, the blood pressure drops. So we as surgeons get a false sense of security that you're not bleeding. And so we're like, okay, so let's close and let's finish the case. But what happens is that when you wake up, you go back to your normal blood pressure. And then when you go back to your normal blood pressure, that is when the blood vessel starts leaking. Imagine mm. like a hose, you, you decrease the pressure and there's no more water coming out. Now you turn the hose on, increase pressure, now the water is, is coming out. And so that's what happens. And that's why you hear about post-operative hematoma or post-operative bleeding. What that means is after surgery bleeding and patients have to be rushed into the emergency room to take care of the bleeding. Why did that happen? Again, it happens at home when they're back to their normal blood pressure. Mm. Now, if you're, under, if you're awake surgery under local anesthesia, then your blood pressure stays nice exactly the way it is. It stays high or not high, but the normal. It doesn't drop. So the surgeon doesn't get the false sense of security that everything is okay. So um, if there's any blood vessels that's leaking, then we'll stop it right away. And you're mentioning about laser. And the thing about laser, the reason why laser is not commonly used in surgery is because laser shoots in a straight line. If you, if you flash a laser, it just goes in a straight line. And our tissue is made, it, it, our tissue, it, our, first of all, our body, there's no linear aspect of our body. Mm -hmm. Every part of our body has a slight turn and a curve. So if you shoot a laser, then it's not accurate. And that's why we don't use laser as much. Okay. Yeah, we just want to get the point across. We got people asking about that with laser surgeries and everything. And of course, of all years of uh, practicing, um, you know, surgery and um, being a, uh, an innovative as well, too. What was the most uh, challenging that you've encountered and how did you uh, manage to overcome that? What was the most challenging you've ever done? Uh, you're talking about a challenging case? Yes. Uh, I mean, one of them, I, uh, there are a couple of challenging cases, but um, one thing is that, you know, I have to, when I first started out, I started doing, um, doing uh, cancer reconstructive surgery. So I did a 13 hour um, uh, cancer that was eroding into the brain. Mm. So, um, so we have to, you know, take the, you know, take the skull out. We have to rebuild the skull and take the tissue from the back, reconnect the vessels. Um, and uh, that whole process took uh, 13 hours, but um, that's a more of a labor intensive surgery. 
Um, but another very challenging surgery is uh, eyelid ptosis surgery. Now, mm -hmm. this is the short surgery is kind of short. It only takes about an hour or so. But it deals with when eye muscle, when one eye is one eye doesn't open as well as the other eye, or both eyes look kind of sleepy. And so uh, that is a more of a muscle correction surgery to make the muscle work better. So imagine you have a muscle that is not working well. It's, it's undergoing muscle dystrophy or degeneration of the muscle. How can I make this muscle work like the way it used to work? So okay. it's a pretty detailed, uh, complex surgery, but I also specialize in that. So for older people or even younger people, uh, they can't open their eyes well, and then they have a lot of forehead wrinkles. Mm -hmm. and, but they have what's known as eyelid ptosis. So eyelid ptosis is, you know, very, very, um, uh, you know, it's very technical surgery. Uh, another surgery is actually facelift because the uh, facelift, there are a lot of vital structures. And, um, you know, again, this is an elective surgery. So to get the most optimal non-pulled look, because often patients think that their face looks very pulled because you're just yanking it. So you don't do that. So you have to release everything, which means that you, our face has so many blood vessels. So not hitting those blood vessels, operating in such precise manner, and then reposition the tissue, um, that requires uh, one to do minimal bleeding technique. And if you do it well, then uh, patients will, uh, they just won't, they don't have bruising, visible bruising. Um, and if they want to see that, they could go to uh, my website is uh, drkennethkim.com, drkennethkim.com. Or they could look at our YouTube video and they could see like how incredibly fast the recovery is because the surgery is so precise. Yeah. That is very interesting. And what's the website again? It's drkennethkim.com. So drkennethkim.com. And they could also go to Dr. Kenneth Kim uh, Plastic Surgery YouTube channel and then they could look at before and after of, let's say, facelift or other procedures and see how fast they recover. And I think patients and the people will be really, really be surprised what precision surgery, what it really is and, mm -hmm. uh, and what they should also demand, or not, I wanna say demand, they should request their surgeons, you know, wherever they're living, they should ask their surgeon, hey, can you do this awake? Because, you know, uh, you know, we're people are living really long time now. Oh, and, yes. um, and, you know, we think that as we get old, our kids will take care of us. But a lot of the times the kids are living out of state and they're busy with their own lives. And it's very difficult for them to take care of um, an elderly person. And when the person start having dementia, it is, you know, you really need a caregiver. And, um, you know, and I think that we have to do everything we can to protect our brain. And, um, you know, and I just think that it is completely unnecessary and do the surgery in the safest way possible. And, um, and you know, and I think it, more patient, more people understand that you don't have to accept the status quo. You don't have to take risk with your life. Mm -hmm. True especially for an elective procedures. And, you know, because we're living so long now, you know, our bodies break down, people look older and people want to look younger. They want to be more fit. Um, so people are doing more and more elective surgeries. And, you know, I'm not against doing elective surgery, uh, but what I am against is them uh, taking risk with their body or them doing something that we know is bad for the brain. Mm. And as I mentioned, you know, if people, any surgery over two hours or any multiple surgery. So let's just say you do one hour surgery, but then next year you do another one hour surgery. That kind of repeated surgery is also really bad for the brain. And mm. I just want patients to not, I just want people to just be aware because, you know, it's really terrible when they're not, they don't know. And then later on, they're like, oh, I just didn't know. 
Uh -huh. And I think with all these uh, modern advances, you know, we mm. should let the word out um, mm. so that you know, they could, you know, that they're mm. aware. And, and of course, you know, less surgeries, less pain, less the insurance and um, everything else too. And uh, what's come up for uh, Dr. Kim uh, in 2024? Find out just one minute. Listen to the Mike Wagner Show at the themikewagnershow.com, powered by SoundCloud Studios and brought to you by official sponsor of the Mike Wagner Show, International Warring Author, Mia Molson Zia Missing. We'll be back with board certified practice reconstructive surgeon from Los Angeles, Dr. Kenneth Kim. After this time. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I wanna give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamoshenzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers, and boy, are you in luck. Right place, right time. Tuned in to The Mike Wagner Show. You heard me. We're a board certified plastic reconstruction surgeon from Los Angeles, Dr. Kenneth Kim here on The Mike Wagner Show. Learned a lot from you regarding surgery and everything else, stuff we all need to know, and that's great information. And what else can we expect in 2024 and beyond, Dr. Kim? Well, I just hope that, you know, more and more uh, other surgeons will uh, adopt this and uh, they will offer it to their patients as well. And I think the way that would happen is, is if the patients would ask their surgeon, hey, can you do this awake? You know, because the surgeons can. Um, it's not that they cannot. I mean, obviously, you know, it's easier if we just put them to sleep. Just mm -hmm. like it's easier if we bombard the city, just 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 bomb it, bomb it, bomb it, and then you could just walk in there and then you know take out the you know hostage or or whatever. But we all know that collateral damage is just not good, mm -hmm. and uh, it just makes sense, right? And it and that in order for the soldiers to be able to do that, they have to be well trained and they have to pay attention. Um, you know, it's almost like if you ask the special forces to shoot, special forces shoot with their scope on and they walk, they run, and they're shooting with their scopes on. So it requires tremendous amount of uh, uh, concentration and it's, it is stressful and it's very taxing. Um, compared to like a regular soldier for them, you know, to do that, it, it is hard, but you have to train yourself. But I think that, you know, I think that surgeons, they should uh, offer that, and uh, and they will offer it if the patients uh, request it, and uh, because you know, and then hopefully you know, with twenty twenty four, we'll have a momentum just like with any advances. Um, you know, initially, um, you know, they need to be aware, mm -hmm. and then once they're aware, and then they they request it, and then then things will change. That is amazing. The way you talk about soldiers, I think you should be around the military for this coming year. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good idea I like that. And who do you consider your biggest influence in your career? Um, you know, it's not, I wouldn't say it was a one uh, person uh, in my career, but what it was is that, you know, is that I'm an immigrant and um, I immigrated from Korea uh, when I was, a, when I was a, when I was a kid. And uh, when you come here, what you do is as an immigrant, immigrants often do compare and contrast. So we're mm -hmm. always looking at things, you know, how did people do it in Korea? How do people do it here? 
living. So you're always looking at looking at things and comparing. And then as an immigrant, life is not easy for right. all immigrants. And America is a land of immigrants. And I think what makes America unique is that we have people who want more out of things. So if you think about, I, even I came here because I was young, because my parents brought us, our whole family here. I had nothing to do with it. But the people who actually make their journey here, they come here for a better life. And I think for me, my parents' mindset was ingrained in me. And I looked at every situation and I said, how can we make it better? Because as an immigrant, um, unless you come with a lot of money or a lot of support, it's a tough life. Right. And you always try to you always try to have an ideal situation, an optimal, an ideal condition. And so I think that helped me think about how can we have an ideal surgery rather than accepting the status quo. Because if you're always thinking, how can I make my life better? Or how can I make surgery better? Again, the moment I loved surgery in medical school, the first thing I thought is, how can I make this better? Mm. So it's that kind of mindset that I think really helped me to create mm. the most optimal. That's why America, if you think about it, you know, we say America is a land of dreams and this and that. It's because America is has a lot of entrepreneurs and we have people who want to make things better, right? I mean, they want to improve the condition. And, I, and, and that's how I look at it. And that's how I look at surgery. It's like, how can we make surgery? It, it hasn't changed in over 100 years. Mm -hmm. Why has it not changed? Because right. the surgeons will say, you know what? It's much easier if the patient just goes to sleep. I don't have to be precise. I don't have to be wearing loops. I don't have to have you know, mental uh, strain of doing all that. I'd rather just fire, you know, fire, <laughs> out, you know, with a machine gun, right? Versus a uh, special ops, you know, special forces, they take individual, boom, boom, boom. They take individual shots, right? And so, um, yeah, so I think it's, it's that, the, the idea of how can we create the most ideal or optimal state. Mm -hmm. And that's very interesting as well, too. I really like that. And what's the best advice you can give to anybody at this point? I say that, you know, I say, do your own research. Nobody cares about your body more than you. You know, we always, we always want to think that, yes, our doctors care about us, but, and they do. I'm not saying that doctors don't, but, you know, often it's human nature to just do the status quo. You know, uh, you know, if you study physics, uh, Newtonian physics, you know, Things in motion stays in motion. Things that are stagnant, you know, they, they stay stagnant. So it's not in our human nature to change things because in order to improve or make things better, it takes a lot of work. Uh, these special forces members did not become that just because they wanted to volunteer. No, they had to train to get there. And, they have, and so, you know, I just want people to just understand that they have to look after their body. And that's why I want to talk to you about this is because I want them to know, be aware, and then make an informed decision. But what is unfortunate is that a lot of people, they don't even get to hear about this. And then after they undergo general anesthesia and they lose memory, by then the damage is already done. There's mm -hmm. no turning back at this point. You only have one life to live. And with that one life, with your body, you have to protect it. And you have to make sure that you're get, you're doing something that is least damaging to your body. And that is so well said, Dr. Kim. That's well said. We're here with um, Board Certified Plastic Reconstruction Surgery in Practicing Los Angeles, Dr. Kenneth Kim on the Mike Wagner Show. Dr. Kim, very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Definitely learned a lot from you. Looking forward to having again soon. Keep us up to date. Keep in touch. Love to have you back. Once again, what's your website? How do people contact you? And how do people inquire about your services and more? Yeah, thank you, Mike. Yeah, so yeah, people can just go to drkennethkim.com. Yes.
Okay. I will right, we'll certainly check that out. Once again, Dr. Kim, a very big thank you for your time. You've been absolutely fantastic. Looking forward to having you again soon. Keep this up to date. Keep in touch. Love having you back. Wish you all best. And Dr. Kim, you definitely have a great future ahead of you. Thank you. The Mike Wagner Show is powered by Sonic Web Studios. If you're looking to start or upgrade your online presence, visit www.sonicwebstudios.com for all of your online needs. Call 1-800-303-3960 or visit us online at www.sonicwebstudios.com to get started today. Mention The Mike Wagner Show and get 20% off your project. Sonic Web Studios, take your image to the next level. Hey everybody, my name is Forbes Riley and I'm an American actress and a TV host. And I was delighted when I got my copy of Missing, which is Extraordinary Relation of Ordinary People based on a real life relationship. It's just, it's well written, it's amazing. You know, it talks about a man who has lost his wife and his daughter and it's very well done. I'm gonna highly recommend that you go get your copy of Missing. It is a powerful, exciting read. Mr. Mian Moshe Zia, he is the author of Missing. And I wanna give a big shout out and a kiss all the way halfway around the world to my dear friend. Check him out at Mia's website. It's called www.miamotionzea.com. Missing, available on Amazon. Again, I'm Forbes Riley and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Mike Wagner Show. Brought to you by international award-winning author Mia Mosin-Zia of Missing. And powered by Sonic Web Studios. Be sure to join us again on over 40 podcast platforms. And of course, on the MikeWagnerShow.com, HamiltonRadio.net, and Diamonds FM. Don't forget to support our program with a generous donation at the MikeWagnerShow.com. Thanks for listening.